Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Director of Social Media for HAR. And I am joined this morning by the host of Garden Line on, K- on 740 KTRH, Randy Lemon. Welcome, Randy. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you were able to join us again this year. You actually joined us last year after that terrible freeze we had. Luckily, we didn't experience that this year, but we wanted to have you back because you shared some excellent tips and we want to talk about that ever important curb appeal with you as well. Um, before we get into all of that, though, uh, Randy, if you would just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, like I said, I'm the host of Garden Line uh, for, uh, at 740 KTRH. I have been the host of Garden Line as co-host for several years before being a solo artist, uh, <laughs> but I've been doing it for about 25 years. Uh, I also want to forewarn everybody, uh, I fostered slash I'm about to adopt a puppy. <laughs> and since it's like a puppy, it's only two and a half months old. Uh, it, it is in my at my feet right now and it gets a little agitated. And I'm not paying 100% attention to it. So you might hear a little yip or a little bark now and then nothing major. It's just a very uh, personality driven little pit bull mix. And <laughs> she is probably going to be in this household for the rest of her life. She'll be my fur baby <laughs> in the yeah. future. And, and it was just supposed to be a fostering situation. Well, I am a foster fail as I fo- found out recently. <laughs> uh, so back to, I, I've been the garden guy for 25 plus years, uh, came from the Texas A&M University faculty staff where I was working with the agricultural communications department. And prior to that, I was at Texas Farm Bureau, also like agricultural communications, radio and television for the Farm Bureau. I grew up in the Houston area though. I uh, grew up in Walnut Bend. Uh, that's where I was for forever. And my whole family ended up moving to the Pearland area after my college years. So I am very familiar with this real estate market. And so since I also have had five family members that were in real estate, my dad passed away recently, but uh, he was, very heavily involved, had a Remax office for years and years and years, but I still have four family members that are real estate. I have probably a dozen friends who are real estate <laughs> agents and everything. So uh, expect me to talk to you like I talk to my family members and my dear friends who actually do ask my advice from time to time and get my consulting services from time to time to help them uh, stage and sell a house from the outside. And that I think is very important. I think that part does not need to be ignored when trying to sell houses. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think it's just about the inside and staging, I, I beg to differ with you. And I've experienced this not just for the 25 years of being the garden guy, but I've experienced it for about 40 years of family members being in real estate. Wonderful. And I think that's what our members want. They want you to be honest with them and and so they can help their clients as much as possible. Let's start a little bit with just touching on the winter that we just came out of. We had a, a light freeze this year, as we said much lighter than what we experienced in 2021. Are you finding um, there was any significant damage done to trees and plants um, if if they even if they were covered? Oh, no, this was this year's freeze is nothing compared to last year when we were talking. Uh, that's delightful because it's so much easier to take care of and easier to clean up. Uh, irony of ironies right now, the weather forecasters locally are predicting a little light freeze uh, Friday night into Saturday morning and maybe mm-hmm. Saturday morning. I don't think it's going to be anything harsh at all. If it does tip into the 32 degree mark, it's only going to be for a nanosecond. Don't worry about it. this kind of freeze they're predicting is all about ratings driven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Get people watching. And one of the uh, forecasting tools that I use didn't even come close to that. They were predicting a low in the Houston KD area with like 38, 39, not 32, 31. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have to kind of, which I like to watch weather forecasting tools way outside of the market because they're a lot more honest about it. They're not trying to scare tactic you for ratings services. Or okay. <laughs> well, very so, good. Oh, and, so yeah. you know, don't panic about this. Even if it does get down to 32 for that nanosecond, it's not enough here in the Houston market, Gulf coast landscaping market to do any damage. Okay, wonderful. I mean, that's great to hear. And we want to talk a little bit about pulling things out. I saw some people in the comments saying too late, I already pulled everything out. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, I wanted to ask you about grass growth, because I know that's something that you're passionate about. I know you have a big following of people that that uh, love to, to take your tips on grass growth. And um, so the winter we had and what we're expecting in the next couple of days, do you think that's going to impact grass growth this year? No. As a matter of fact, we've been encouraging people on Garden Line to do, as you noted, people get kind of uh, 
fervent about the the schedule, my schedule, mm-hmm. the garden line fertilization schedule, which anybody can get right now at randylemon.com. Uh, by the way, just introduced a new website, randylemon.com, but we have several domain names. So uh, you could be in Cyprus, you could be in Katy, you could be in Houston and be gardening in houston.com, gardening in Katy.com, gardening, you name it. We have about 32 mm-hmm. domain names that all come back to randylemon.com. And on the main part of the screen, it says Randy Schedules, and you just click on that schedule and commit to it. Here's and here's the perfectly timed for all the realtors out there that want that like instant mm-hmm. gratification curb appeal, uh, especially once this weekend's little cold snet is over with, you can definitely green the grass up really quickly with the first application in the schedule. We call it the early green up. It's a fast acting 15-510. And uh, there are lots of 15-510s out there, but we have you know a few that we pinpoint people to. But just as long as it's just a fertilizer, just a fertilizer. Don't weed and feed it yet because if you're covered in weeds, you got a whole com- bunch of other problems that that lawn has not been taken care of, that soil's not been taken care of. But if there's any you know, solid amount of grass there and it's still just looking a little brown from the winter, we can pop it into action with that early green up. And I'm not, I'm seriously saying in about two weeks from now, if you put it out, put it out today, you, know, you put it out, well, put it out on a dry day. It's been <laughs> misting where I'm at in Katy all morning. Uh, you don't want to put the fertilizer on wet grass blades, mm-hmm. but you can definitely put it out on a dry grass blades. And in about two weeks, you'll see it greening up. And that's first, um, that's the first line of curb appeal that we go for here. And so I always encourage my real estate friends to get after the schedule early in February, as early as possible. And the, the little cold weather does not affect it in a negative way because it's all about soil temperature. And we were 82 degrees yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so the soil temperature is going to be just fine for the next couple of weeks. All right. So, Randy, um, getting back to the questions we had here for you, how can I determine and especially with fruit trees, we know how sensitive fruit trees can be. So how can I determine if plants uh, and trees are dead or likely to recover from the winter that we just had? Pretty simple right now. You just go out there and do a little pruning, nip tucking, cutting on limbs and looking for green wood underneath the prune. And as long as you have that green uh, underneath the bark, then that fruit tree's fine. All, all the peaches, plums, pears, all the stone fruit trees, they made it through last year's freeze. So this year's freeze, not a problem. Uh, as long as you protected trunks on newly planted citrus trees, we lost almost all the citrus trees due to last year's freeze. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Uri freeze was so devastating. But mm-hmm. uh, we can definitely do uh, so many more fruits than probably any. I'm going to, this is going to look jol- jolty. I'm going to try to get this on a okay. uh, evil stand for you, but Great. I can still talk and do this at the same time. All right. Um, I think that. Uh, everybody should be pruning their fruit trees right now. March, the first week of March is the pruning tree, pruning of fruit trees time of the year. All right. And look at that. Perfect. Now I'm on an easel. All, All right. right. <laughs> Technology, isn't it a fun thing? Sure. Um, I, I think that if you get out there and just do the pruning that you're supposed to do right now, you'll find out what's alive and what's not. All right. Sounds good. So the beginning of March. Um, very good. So um, let's hear, I want to hear your thoughts on yard improvement, curb appeal. And again, you said you have multiple friends and family that are realtors. So I know you suggest this to them quite often, but as we know, home sellers, um, they might be on a tighter budget. They're looking to save money on improvements and things like that. Do you believe this is a good place to try to save money? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, come on. You, you had me on hold for a few minutes before we went live, and I was listening to all the statistics. Home sales are up everywhere. We know that. People are buying homes without even looking at them. But for those people that still need walk-ups, they're doing uh, open houses, uh, I think the aesthetic of the outside of the house is critically important. All right, And for you to not spend a couple of hundred dollars on really good-looking mulch, here's the first thing. Avoid dyed mulch at all possible costs. It looks tacky. It doesn't look professional. And if you're, and I, now I'm talking to everybody as if you are my family members, right? <laughs> if you have ever encouraged anybody to put out black dyed mulch for curb appeal, shame on you. It doesn't work. Horticulturally speaking, it's not healthy for the soil. So now you're ruining the future horticulture in those soils. Everything's going to get sicker and sicker and sicker with black dyed mulch. Red dyed mulch is bad too, but let's focus on what everybody seems to want to use. And I've heard real estate people, I've seen postings on Facebook by real estate people 
well, let's just hope they're not HAR members, right? Uh, <laughs> they're just like going, yeah, put out the black dyed mulch right now. It's going to look really sharp. No, it's not. It's going to look tacky. It's going to look unprofessional, and it's going to cause problems in the future. For the same amount of money, you could put out a shredded hardwood mulch, a compost as a mulch, and it's going to look more professional, and it's going to give it a sharper look, but it's going to be healthy. And plus, it's uh, to me, I'm speaking horticulturally here. It is mm -hmm. tacky-looking black dyed mulch, absolutely tacky. And when you're trying to sell a house, you don't want tacky outside. So that's the first thing you can do. The other one is, is clean up. It's, it doesn't cost much for you to prune some things. Just clean up pruning, straighten things up at this time of the year. It makes a huge difference. I've sold enough houses with the help of friends and family members over the years to know how uh, one house I sold in Cyprus, the, the, the inside was you know immaculate. Don't worry about that. I know how to stage a house, right? But mm -hmm. uh, the thing that got the people's attention was how beautiful the landscape was out front and how beautiful the landscape was in the back. I think it makes a huge difference. You're not spending thousands of dollars to repair and replace things. You're spending a few hundred dollars. Now, a lot of people are also thinking, you talk about sellers that are on a budget. Well, who's on a budget right now when everybody's buying things 20% over the original price? So mm -hmm. I, I want them to think about that. They may be making an extra $8,000 above and beyond what they thought they were going to. I think you can afford four or $500 to do cleanup and make the landscape look good. So I, I am um, I'm antagonistic about it uh, <laughs> with real estate people online on Facebook mm -hmm. because uh, we've got to stop this use of dyed mulch, period. Okay, um, we actually, uh, somebody, Catherine said, what type of mulch did you say was good to use? Oh, there's several. If you actually do go to randylemon.com, you can get into the mulch section and okay. read, there's, a, there's several varieties. Me trying to like, recite all those different types of mulches. The, the, the key words when you go to a nursery garden center or a soil yard is I want a native shredded hardwood mulch or compost as mulch. Compost as mulch is dark. And if you, you're after the dark look, why people use dyed mulch, mm -hmm. uh, then start using compost as a mulch. A little more expensive than mulch by a cubic yard and, and bags, but it's so well worth it. It's what I've been doing is mulch for probably eight, nine years now on any landscape that I work with, I use compost as mulch because I like that dark, mm -hmm. but it keeps the dark longer and you're feeding the soil over time as opposed to poisoning the soil with the dye. Makes sense. Um, we had a comment that came in. Tanya said, uh, actually it wasn't Tanya, I apologize. Uh, but somebody had made a comment that they stopped using that dyed mulch because they were having issues and they got mold and it, it fixed. Everything was great after that. So wonderful. Um, okay. So m I saw a couple other questions here. Um, Tanya said, should I adjust the fertilizing schedule or add anything for a lawn that is waterfront, salt water? If you get salt water, you know, um, because of tropical storms, tropical depressions, and we get the, the flow of water in on waterfront. Yeah. You should, after the water recedes, you should always uh, treat it with soil activator. You can also add trace minerals, trace elements, and then always water that in with soil mm -hmm. activator. Soil activator is a micro, uh, it's, it's microbiology. What's happening is eating up the salt, eating up the bad elements in the soil mm -hmm. and making sure that nature's own microorganisms are doing good things to the soil at the same time as it taking away the bad stuff. So yeah, I, uh, I had a beach house one time um, and anytime there was a, a storm surge or just you know the flow of water came in because of high tides uh i would try to get in there with soil activator and of course that helps immediately okay wonderful That's tiffany had a, a question here um our lawn guy wants to fertilize and aerate our lawn for 350 dollars. is that necessary and is that reasonable it's unreasonable and you should be doing your own fertilization hence the schedules and the protocols that we talk about at randylemon.com. I can save people so much money by doing fertilization themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Done cost comparisons with, you know, companies like True Green, Kim Wan in the past. And uh, you're still, you're always going to have a greener yard if you do it yourself, as opposed to having somebody else do it for you. Now, some people just don't have the time or inclination to get out there and spread fertilizer on the soil. I get that. Uh, but if you have a mowing crew, you buy the product and then and buy a spreader and then on the days 
per my schedule that it's supposed to be done, you set it out that mm-hmm. week of your lawn crew coming out there and they'll usually do it for you for an extra, you know, 20 bucks or uh, you can pay them in advance to be doing that, you know, four or five times a year, throwing something out for you. But I think that if you uh, have your skin, have a little bit of skin in this game, you're always going to have a better looking landscape if you do this work yourself. That And that's the way it used to be years ago. Uh, more and more people are hiring more and more lawn mowing crews to do all their work for them. And then they just let them put the diet mulch out. They let them put weed and feeds out, poison and kill trees. So by you getting out your hands a little bit dirty on this and have a little skin in the game, you're going to have a much better looking landscape and yard than anybody else in the neighborhood. I, I no doubt a I minute. Mean, <laughs> I'm trying to think there's nobody that's a real estate agent around me. Right. Uh, I definitely have the greenest yard on the block. And I'm, I'm just doing bare minimum work, but it's just because I'm willing to put the time and effort into it. I'm willing to mow my own yard, too, and I mow correctly as opposed to lawn mowing crews who mow too short on St. Augustine grass and it gives it that kind of yellow tinge. And then you have the person who's not following the schedule and mowing improperly. And then these where you get the worst looking yards out there. Talk about horrible curb appeal when trying to sell a house. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Very good. Um, a question came in from Rene Galvan. He said, what is the best material to use to level a lawn? We actually encourage the use of compost as a top dressing. There are enriched topsoils when you have a lot of undulation problems you got to fix. Enriched topsoil has compost built into it. So when you're getting soil from a soil yard, uh, you're you, you need that kind of leveling soil in bulk. So you either get their version of ETS, enriched topsoil, and it goes by a hundred different names, turf mix, pro turf mix, uh, uh, landscapers pride is called uh, healthy soil compost. So it, it kind of incorporates everything. But for us, when we're trying to level out yards and just kind of, and then repair them at the same time, compost is the answer because compost has come a long way in 25 years. Uh, where it's sifted and it's uh, it's a definitely a fine particle as opposed to chunky, what we used to think of compost like 50 years ago, chunky animal-based manure. Well, vegetative mm-hmm. compost looks like dirt. It really does, but it's so enriched with all kinds of beneficial bacteria and all kinds of beneficial fungi that we solve, uh, we can fix bacteria, bacteria and fungal problems in the soil with the compost and the top dressing, but at the same time, we're leveling it out Years ago, I mean, I, I saw it happen when I grew up in Walnut Bend, uh, the subdivision, and I saw it all the time up until about 1985 or so. Every time somebody wanted to bring in level, they brought in that red sand. We call it bank sand. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of clay, soil, and sand blended together. And it did absolutely nothing but level out the soil. It did nothing beneficial for mm-hmm. the root of the grass. And so we've learned a lot in the last, well, technically 30 years about how to level with different things, but they're more enriched with compost than just sand. You just put sand out there nowadays, you're creating a, you're creating a drainage problem because mm-hmm. what you're doing, you have levels of sand, levels of clay down low. And so nothing's draining fully through there. It may drain through the sand, but then it goes off because of the clay soil. So when we enrich the soil aeration and compost top dressing, that's the key to success on our lawns here in the future. And it doesn't matter if it's St. Augustine, Bermuda, or Zoya. Okay. Um, going back to those high prices you were mentioning for some things or, and some of the estimates people were getting, Amina said, "What is why has the cost for tree removal gotten so high? We received estimates $1,400 to $2,100 for the removal and stump grinding of one tree. Wow. Um, how much time we got? That's a, that is a topic that I can talk long about, mm-hmm. but it's only because I know the industry quite well. Uh, number one, uh, fuel costs have gone way up, okay, in, in that industry. And they're running the machines like stump grinders, which burns through fuel mm-hmm. so quickly. When chainsaws burn through fuel so quickly. So you have, if anybody thinks that this uh, economy and the what we have in the news and you hear about all the time with this price increase and the inflation, uh, this got, uh, has been adapted everywhere. Cost of fertilizer is up. Uh, mm-hmm. The lawn crews are starting to raise their prices. Tree companies though, I don't know how to get into more of a fine point on this. Um, 
tree removal costs are based on whether you've let a tree go too long and if it's truly dead and it's uh it has to be taken down piece by piece as opposed to one being felled uh those raise price increases but a depending on the size of the tree too uh i've seen tree removal upwards of three thousand dollars for a day's worth of work on one tree and that's just getting it down um it is people don't appreciate how hard it is the kind of the, the threat of injury and damage and everything and that insurance has gone way up for these companies so they're having to pass that cost along uh but i don't see fourteen hundred dollars for a tree removal if that includes a stump grinding as being ridiculously overpriced that seems to be a very fair price depending on the size of the tree if i and i do there are companies Let's do this. I mean, I feel like I'm on Garden Line, the radio show right now. Let me give you a surprise. that <laughs> has nothing to do with curb appeal. Other than that, I will tell you this. If you still have dead palm trees in a landscape and you're trying to sell a house, again, come on, shame on you. Mm -hmm. uh, that should have been removed a long time ago because we knew these palm trees were dead by, you know, June, July of mm -hmm. 2021. If you're still sitting there going, I hope they're going to come back. <laughs> I'm going to wait. I think they're going to come back. No, they're not. Get them removed. And a palm removal is not that expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be done fairly easily. And I do know companies that will do that for a reasonable charge, but uh, they're not just necessarily tree removal companies. Mm -hmm. uh, tree removal companies will overcharge on palm removal because they don't want to do it. But the palm yeah. experts will want to do it for you. So um, uh, anything that's dead in the yard that you know is dead tree, get it removed. And I know that that's going to cost you, but it's better than if it, a storm comes through and takes a dead tree or dead palm into the house, into a fence, into the neighbor's property. Now we're talking an insurance nightmare on everybody's hand. Okay, and that was the other thing. Tree companies that are insured properly and they have workman's comp on their workers, they are more expensive. But there are companies out there. I'm not telling you on this because this can be recorded. I can't tell you the names of the company. You can come find me in person at my appearances. Um, or you can ask me emails and I'll tell you some companies to stay away from because they purposely overcharge. That's why we recommend on the garden line, go get about three bids for tree removal. You're going to have a high one. You're going to have a real low one. And that company's not insured. <laughs> stay away from them. And you're going to find a reasonable one. Mm -hmm. Go with the reasonable bid in the middle or the affordable tree uh, or affordable bid in the middle because that's always a little bit more stained than uh, if someone try, bid a $3,000 tree removal for the same company that bid it $1,400, mm -hmm. oh, I can, I can get a, a crew to come in for $500 and take that out, Randy, and they're not insured, and something breaks, and something goes awry, and it's all on your insurance, and it's on you, and that becomes the insurance nightmare you do not want to have happen. That's why you have to have proof of insurance when you have mm -hmm. a tree removal being done, and you should always go with the most reasonable bid. You should get multiple bids. Okay, wonderful, wonderful suggestions there. Um, we had a couple of questions about drainage, uh, and uh, Robert was saying, what would be the best modification to a yard to keep it from flooding during heavy rain? Um, Carolyn said, can you tell us about French drain? So would French drain be a solution there, or what other suggestions or modifications could you make? Well, there's catch drains, there's French drains, there's definitely just rock paths for drainage. Uh, I am not an expert at this, but mm -hmm. I usually, when people have standing water days after a rain, you've got a drainage problem. You need to solve that drainage problem. You get with, and this goes to the discussion with the uh, tree removal. You find a couple of irrigation companies, get three different bids on what it's going to take to solve your drainage problem. You're going to, once again, you're going to see somebody way up on the scale. You're going to see somebody way down on the scale. And if they're not insured, and they're breaking pipes, breaking irrigation systems, breaking lighting, you know, whatever, then you have that insurance nightmare. So make sure they're insured and make sure you get the reasonable bid. But drainage, uh, like just throwing sand on it doesn't solve a drainage problem, it just moves it to the other side. So that's why having a professional irrigation company come in and put together a game plan for the catch drain, the French drain, combination thereof, uh, rerouting certain drainage. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a very detailed business, and you got to go with the experts on that. I've never dis I've never found a homeowner, unless he's just like an engineering trained and loves to solve problems. I've never found a typical homeowner. I kind of consider myself a typical homeowner 
I don't want to touch. I don't want to want to get involved with drainage problems. I leave that in the hands of the experts. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we had a question about going back to fertilizers. Donna said, "What fertilizer is safe for animals?" All my fertilizer, everything on my schedule, is perfectly safe for animals. All right. The the it's not a joke. Sorry, the chair is getting a little wobbly on me here because I had to get out of it to try to find out where the audio went. Um, every one of my schedules is perfectly safe for animals, even if it's the synthetic schedule. The synthetic products that are on the schedule products that we recommend uh, are used in the uh, feed industry for cattle in places like South America and some places in the United States. So uh, nothing that I recommend is going to be poisonous to the plant or the soil. And like if a dog were to snoot around and try to eat some of that grass, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been, the schedule has been its own device for 20 plus years and we've never had any complaints, never had any, you know, people saying their dog got sick and died because they used our schedule. There were fertilizers 50 years ago that were very poisonous to animals, but they, they're not even on the market anymore. They're usually based in anhydrous ammonia. There's some names you, you know, yeah, write that down. Don't make me spell it, but write that down. <laughs> When, uh, we don't have those in our products and we have uh, organic schedule too if you just want to play it 100 percent safe the irony there is uh there's a local company here in houston called uh san jacinto environmental which puts together the micro life fertilizers and micro life 100 organic and the dogs love micro life they want to eat it every time it goes mm. down they'll never eat enough to get sick they're never going to eat enough to get poisoned but it is hilarious to watch the dogs especially bigger dogs like retriever style dogs. They love whatever it is. And it's all natural. That's why mm -hmm. it is basic nutrition for the dogs and cats. Don't worry about it. If you use an organic fertilizer and your animals are eating the fertilizer you just put out. Okay. Our dog loves to go after the fruit tree food after we feed our fruit trees. That's what she yes. likes to dig that up. So we have to put fencing temporary fencing around them when we do it. All right. Very good. Um, so a couple more questions here, and then I'm going to get back to a few of the questions that I had for you. Uh, Rendy said, help, gophers and moles are destroying our yard and pasture. Do you have any suggestions for Rendy? Yeah, and, and they're a real estate agent? This, this person that's asking the question I, is I, in real estate? I'm not sure. I believe so. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would say, oh, my advice always is to get a real estate agent to sell the house. <laughs> <laughs> It's because it is not an easy task. Uh, they're after insects, so you got to solve the the grub worm problem. Usually, the worm problem. They're they're uh, moles and voles and pocket gophers. They're after insects that are in the soil. Um, I tell you this: if you have acreage, I did, this is not a joke. All right, have some barn cats. Uh, when I lived out on acreage out in Rose Hill, Texas, uh, the first thing I did was we started. I say recruiting. Uh, we started adopting cats that they were going to be outdoor barn cats. And, you know, they they sleep in comfort every night in the barn or the garage. But so if you have the capacity to have cats that are barn cats, they basically hunt the baby moles before they get big enough to do any damage. Mm. That is sincerely the best, smartest way to control moles in the yard. But pocket gophers are a little bit different story. So you solve the insect problem, eventually you'll solve uh, the mole vole pocket gopher problem. And that just means, you know, getting some and being consistent about the use of grub control. Mm -hmm. And there are a hundred grub control products on the market. Okay, wonderful. Um, Kay had, um, actually, I'm sorry. Yes, Kay had a question. What are the best flowers for now through summer? Uh, so right now, petunias. Petunias, uh, gar not gardenias, what am I thinking? Geraniums, petunias, uh, pintas. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> I actually have, have a book somewhere around this office that you can go through a list. But what I, uh, what I like to do in turn, and I, I'm trying to answer some of these for real estate agents and mm -hmm. curb appeal like that. Mm -hmm. One of the smartest things to do is to get the long running, uh, like petunias are the perfect example. Uh, used to be 30 years ago, petunias were only there for about two months, right? And in the past 20 years, we have so much more developments of, say, a petunia that has a longer season. 
So if I can get a petunia to go for four months, then I can shift to the summer loving annuals. Mm -hmm. And then those are going to make it all the way to the first freeze. Boom. I've covered at least eight, nine months. And all I needed is two infusions of flowers in color pockets. Uh, I love that concept written about it many years in the past uh, about color pockets so that we're not, you know, I don't want a long row of, you can't see my hands, but here we go. You don't need this long row of nothing but flowers in a landscape. I want a pocket here and a pocket there. Uh, and then other colorful plants by leaf there. And we call it color tearing with plants. I think that is incredible curb appeal as opposed to just shoving a bunch of flowers in there and hoping that they're going to make it more than two months. Right. That, uh, that's what we did years ago. Okay. Tiffany asked, what about pansies? Would you suggest pansies at this time of year? Pansies are the cool season. That's when we get to October, November, November, December, January, February. That's the plant for four months long, along with things like snapdragons. Those are the cool season. So right now we are making that shift towards the spring type annuals. Perfect mm -hmm. example thereof is the petunias, pintas, i have just dropped uh, – geraniums uh, geraniums are going to go really bad the minute we hit 90 degrees and unfortunately people yeah. that have come from places like london and paris and uh, some of the european countries they get to grow geraniums pretty much year round because their consistent temperature mm -hmm. and the cool breezes near the water and lack of humidity that we have that we have intense humidity that tears up certain mm -hmm. flowering plants we're limited on flowering plants in the houston market the gulf coast gardening market because of our heat and humid our humidity mm -hmm. absolutely um and you said geraniums will go bad once it's 90 degrees in houston that could be yeah. next week for all we know right <laughs> <laughs> all right um it's yeah. 82 degrees yesterday now go outside I mean, it's on. nuts um zelda had a, a question um she's planted fruit trees and uh in her garden um, and veggie trees, um, and they tend to go rotten before they fully ripen. Does she need to have her soil tested to see what's causing that? If she just keeps trying to go back in the same soil, forget the testing. <laughs> Let's start over. Um, the soil is our key to success in all garden. You, you name the gardening. Lawn care, mm -hmm. vegetable beds, herbs, planting trees, planting shrubs. Our soil is the key to success. So I actually for vegetable beds and for planting of fruit trees, we have a uh, recipe called two parts rose soil, one part compost. Mm -hmm. Say it with me, everyone. Two parts rose soil, one part compost. And you should, if you keep going in that same soil with the same vegetables, well, yeah, you're supposed to change it out at least every other year. We're not going to keep going back in that same soil. But if you're also, I don't know what she was doing with soil, but was she actually doing anything like building a bed? Was she using peat moss-based soil for outdoor veggie bed? I don't recommend that mm -hmm. at all. Uh, anytime I've ever written about building beds, we don't use peat moss-based soils for outdoor beds. Peat moss-based soils are designed for containers, designed for pots, uh, pottery gardening. And you can do flowers and like tomatoes in that. But I mean, the minute you go on outside, the elements, you're creating all kinds of rotting issues on the root system with peat moss in the soil okay so if you've been here, here's a great mm -hmm. trick not trick here's a great tip mm -hmm. for anybody who's ever bought their soil at a big box store right i'm going to see it today i'm going to go to costco to go get water and paper towels for I've got a couple of events i gotta you know get some bulk product from but so people go to the big box store they go to a mass merchandiser uh, they go to a Costco or a Sam's. They, oh, look at all that soil for two dollars a bag. Flip it over, and if that bag, the ingredients should be there, and it'll say made with. And if peat moss or sphagnum peat moss is in the first two ingredients, that is not an outdoor soil. Mm. You avoid it at all possible costs. Right? Okay. And that's the problem. Most people that are trying to save money cannot <clears> be blunt <throat> against. Yeah, I, I have real estate family members. I have real estate friends. They're the cheapest SOVs I know, and they're always looking for the best deal possible. They don't care about the quality of the product. They're looking for the, oh, my God, $1.99 a bag of products. Well, I'm all over it. <laughs> Cheap SOV. Uh, it's about the quality of the soil, and that's why I would always recommend that you're buying your soil from 
the nurseries, the garden centers, the hardware stores that I recommend on the Garden Line radio program, mm-hmm. and they will always have the high quality stuff. Spend the money on the soil. There's an old adage, maybe uh, some of you heard about it in the past, but it was like old sage gardening advice from years ago. It is better to plant a 25 cent plant in a $5 hole versus a $5 plant in a 25 cent hole. And so if you work the soil, you can get anything to work down here if you do the soil correctly. But when you make these mistakes by buying the cheapest this and the cheapest, and mm-hmm. that applies to mulch too. And people love dyed mulch because it's the cheapest mulch out there. Right. Spend the money on that quality and you're going to succeed with the garden. Great. Um, so Kay had asked about flower recommendations. Is there a plant or tree that homeowners and home sellers should avoid? Oh, yeah. Well, again, we don't have enough time to do that either. <laughs> uh, but let me throw out a few. First of all, um, be very careful, very leery of places that are selling anything called a Piru palm, P-I-R-U, P-I-R-U. A Piru palm is not designed for this climate in a couple of different ways. But more importantly, we will get down below 40 degrees a lot, right? A Piru palm can barely handle 40 degrees. So you know we lost them all last year's freeze, and we've lost some Peru palm this year. Unfortunately, there's some, uh, I'm not even going to name names, but there are unfortunate tree palm purveyors in the Houston market that sell this because they know they can make a ton of money off of it because they grow it so cheap over in uh, Southern California or Arizona. And that's where it doesn't freeze ever. Mm. And that's where the Peru palms work the best. So they've played with the name a lot. That's one definitely avoid uh, i would avoid silver leaf maples at all possible costs because they'll be dead in under 12 years and then now you have a tree removal cost um one of the, what's a couple other things we should avoid using anything in the red tip fatinia family and you should avoid anything in the uh wax leaf ligustrum family these are all going to die from diseases over time and they're because of those diseases that you really just can't get a handle on nowadays um, they're going to look pathetic in a landscape. Mm. Why would we want to keep pushing forward on a pathetic looking plant when we know we're not going to be able to heal? So there's, there's a few for you. Um, mm-hmm. I think that I would not purposely plant because a root system of cottonwood, you, they banned cottonwoods in certain communities around the greater, greater Houston area because it's such a bad, it, it's the root systems are like invasive to plumbing. That's why you don't do that. Plus, the, the, the fluffy stuff that a cottonwood sheds during the spring is uh, horrible for people with allergies. Mm. So let's avoid those. I, there's there's a bunch that I, I just can't think of off the top of my head. But I'm glad that question was asked. Whoever asked that question, that's a great avoid. When you see something says will grow really fast, you, here's a tree that will grow 10 feet every year. It's not designed for this climate, and that means it's going to crater early. It's not going to have a long life, and it's going to end up having to be removed, and it's going to end up having to make a mess around that. Uh, I would avoid planting crepe myrtles up next to houses, and I would avoid planting crepe myrtles next to pools. That is the biggest, messiest thing in a pool is crepe myrtle flowers Mm -hmm. uh, falling into the pool, and they have a hard time filtering that stuff out. I love crepe myrtles. Uh, They're trees. That's another thing. Can we teach everybody this? If you've ever listened to Garden Line, stop taking part in the annual crepe myrtle massacre where everybody <laughs> cuts it back to the same knuckles every year. All right. Stop doing that. It's a tree. Name me one other tree that gets cut back to the same place every year. The answer is none. And a crepe myrtle is by definition a tree. So it shouldn't be pruned like that every year. Oh, but Randy is brushing up next to the house. Well, you planted it in the wrong place. It's a tree. We don't plant trees right up next to the house. Okay. There's a good lecture point for you. And yeah. all you real estate agents out there, now you're going to go, uh, every house you go look at over the next couple of weeks, you're, you're going to go, oh, my God, look, yeah, that, oh, my God, look. Yeah, well, and <laughs> even more so, point if it's you're work, working with a buyer client, pointing some of these things out to those buyers, that tree is, is not, is not going to be great for you in the near future. Uh, Ruth had a question about roses. Uh, what is the secret to growing beautiful roses? Mine don't get very full. And sometimes the, the stems stay very skinny. What was the key to success in all gardening? Do you remember Christina here in Houston? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> the soil. The soil. Roses yeah, that's right. have to be in a, 
a significantly raised bed. If you're trying to grow roses in the existing soil, that's yeah. exactly what it sounds like she was doing. Uh, you, you have to have raised beds. You go, there's a great website called HoustonRose.org. HoustonRose.org is the website for the Houston Rose Society. Mm -hmm. There's a chock full of great information about growing roses here, and it all starts with building the beds. Uh, I mentioned earlier the vegetable bed is two parts rose soil, one part compost. Well, rose soil, and it has to be in rose soil. And some people call it a garden mix and landscapers mix. But if it's made correctly, we've known that for years as rose soil. It's an equal blend of humus, uh, sand, and soil. And you get that perfect blend, and the root systems want to move laterally uh, on a rose, azaleas too. Then you plant them correctly, they're going to thrive here. Roses do like it. Now, the only trade-off is you have to be out there every two, three weeks and treat for uh, fungal disease. That's mm. just that is part and parcel of trying to grow roses in Houston because of our humidity. But once you get it down to science and you know exactly when you need to be out there with the uh, fungal disease spray, then you will have, if they're planted in the right soil. Oh, and here's the other thing. A lot of people don't know this is, and I had to learn this 25 years ago. Roses are the heaviest feeders. They want to eat the most. They're, you're the, they're the ravenous dog that has mm. to be fed four times a day. They need to be fed every 30 to 45 days. So your feet, if you can start feeding them in February, mark your calendar every 15th of the month, feed them. You're going to have more success with roses. And just, yes, use a rose food. There are plenty of them out there on the market. Uh, most people will feed them one or two times a year and then wonder why they're not doing so well. And most people will put roses in the existing soil and wonder why they're not doing so well. There you go. I know why sense. they're not doing so well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Several people were typing in soil. I'm sure they were all screaming at their screens. It's soil, Christina. And I knew that answer. I don't know why I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> um, Trish said, uh, is there a special soil for plumerias? Uh, yes, but uh, they, they truly, those are interesting plant because they don't need as much of a healthy soil as they just need to be able to uh, be wide open, total sun, fed with plumeria food consistently. I see the most successful plumeria growers definitely growing it in a very light, fluffier than normal soil for that root system. Mm -hmm. um, once again, this is I I don't grow plumerias. Right? I gave up on trying to grow plumerias a long time ago. Um, I don't have the patience for plumerias. But if you get good at plumerias, it'll be you'll become part of that subculture. <laughs> and <laughs> then all you need to do to be part of that subculture. And you ever want any information about plumerias, it's based right here in the Galveston, Houston area, is the International Plumeria Society is based right here. And it's mm -hmm. um, the the website is theplumeriasociety.org, theplumeriasociety.org. Great. There I like that Trish. name because there was a lot of other plumeria societies internationally that tried to crop up when people were developing websites 20 years ago. And they realized that they were the, they were the best. They mm -hmm. were the original. So they just got smart and put the word the in front of it, the plumeriasociety.org. Very good. Uh, Rosa asked about azaleas. Are they okay to plant um, around the front of the house or the side of the house? As long as you build a bed specifically for azaleas. Um, if you drive through some areas like Tanglewood, uh, Tangle Wild, River Oaks, Bel Air, you know, some of the, uh, even the Walnut Bends, Briargo Parks, uh, the, the rose, I'm sorry, the azalea beds were built years ago. You'll notice it's just azaleas in those beds. Problem nowadays, and you see this, and I, I get to blame builders on this because the landscapers that builders use, they try to throw a ton of stuff in a landscape and make it look like it's all kinds of cool stuff in there uh, in the uh, model homes. Uh, definitely in the model homes. Mm -hmm. And so you see uh, people that are new to the area see, oh, the azaleas, and then they have that, and then they have that, and they have that. Oh, well, we'll put that with the azaleas when we're building our new home, building our new bed. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work that way. Azaleas, like roses, need to be in their own bed so they're not competing, their root system's not competing with uh, anything else. Very good. Makes sense. Um, I'm sure this very popular question for you, being that we are in Houston, um, Yura asked, are there plants um, that work to keep mosquitoes away and other flying insects? Yes, there are, but it's not worth the effort. Um, <laughs> let me give you an example. So we all know the name Centronella, mm -hmm. right? Uh, also, and I'm not saying this just because it's my last name, but there's also a really great 
uh, plant called lemongrass mm -hmm. that is great at mosquito repellency when you get the oils out of them and put them in little spray bottles or candles and they'll keep mm -hmm. them wet. If you were to plant, and we'll use citronella and lemongrass as the two examples, I, I can plant them a, a whole perimeter around my landscape or my, my deck, mm -hmm. right? So I have this deck, I need all these plants. Uh, the way it works for them to be the insect repellent, you gotta go and crush every leaf mm -hmm. <laughs> and release the oil. <laughs> That's how it works. So just planting a landscape with things like lemongrass does not mm -hmm. keep the mosquitoes away unless you release the oils. Now you do that, you're damaging the plant and the plant's gonna look like crap mm -hmm. over a long period of time. So uh, just stick with the things like the citronella candles, the lemongrass candles, the, the misting that you can do. You can do it organically. You can actually do it you know, with other sprays to keep mosquitoes away, but just trying to plant landscape plants to keep mosquitoes away is, uh, it's an effort and futility. How's that? Okay, makes sense. Archie had a question about bamboo. Um, can you control bamboo or remove it completely? No, and yes, <laughs> I can't <laughs> control it. Um, so then thus, I do need to get rid of it. And look, there are two distinct types of bamboos out there. We've gotten a lot better. The landscaping companies, landscapers, the nurseries and garden centers have got better about selling what is known as clumping bamboo. Clumping bamboo is easier to control. Running bamboo is what got planted years ago and has taken over certain landscapes and uh, that cannot be controlled. So we have to thus get rid of it. I, um, I don't have the ability because I had to get off of the computer, mm -hmm. um, but I could have if I was still on the computer, kind of prove a point, go to randylemon.com. Anytime you need a like a subject matter address, uh, even though randylemon.com is only a little more than a month old, uh, we, we keep adding content to it on a weekly basis. I wrote a getting rid of bamboo once and for all tip sheet a long time ago. I'm pretty sure that is in our new uh, iteration of randylemon.com. Okay. So you could go to uh, randylemon.com. There's a little search uh, bar down below. Just type in the word bamboo and you'll see that tip sheet. But they, here's the Reader's Digest version. Mm -hmm. You have to cut it all down to the ground level. Then you have to cover that with tarp or black plastic and anchor it down so that for six months it gets no water, no sunshine, no air, no nothing. Mm. Right? And you can suffocate that root system to death, but you can't just spray a herbicide on it. It's not going to work that way. Okay. That makes sense. So and we've been sharing wording. links uh, to several different, your watering basics, the mulch, the bamboo, how to, we've been sharing a lot of those in the comments. So everybody should be able to see those. So Randy, um, you've mentioned your consulting business. Um, and so how can people get in contact with you? How can they learn more about this, whether they're a realtor and they're wanting to help their client or just for their own personal use? How can people get in contact with you for more information um, and to just get any of their other questions answered? That great. I mean, it, there, this is not, it's not a place for Q and a it's with not an email answering service at randylemon.com, mm -hmm. but you can go through there and find a ton of answers in the little search bar at the bottom of the screen. Find out if that topic's been covered. Eventually it will be covered. And as we keep building it and building it and building it and adding more content, it will all be answered. But if it's not there yet, it will be there soon. And then in the very bottom, bottom part of the right hand of the main screen, main page, there's a link to consulting. And if real estate agents would like to use me as a consultant to say, here's how we can make this curb appeal happen quicker, faster. Uh, that's what Randy Lemon Consulting is all about. With just regular clients, we work with what you have. We, we don't fix what ain't broke, but we try to solve all the problems and make mm -hmm. for instant gratification, instant curb appeal. Uh, I would be happy to offer anybody that is a real estate agent a bit of a discount above and beyond because I have such uh, so many connections with real estate people. I've done Randy Lemon Consulting probably for about a dozen real estate friends over the last five years. Uh, I got really busy last year with my real estate friends mm -hmm. because they needed to know whether those palms were dead or not. But if you go there, it, it tells you what to do by using the word consulting or consultation in the subject line. But if you, the real estate agents will do a dash H-A-R right next to the word consulting or consultation, I'll know to uh, provide a discount. And uh, I'll have a virtual assistant who can provide, uh, her name is Terry, and she can provide you the details on what it takes to get Randy Lemon Consulting out there 
uh, to give you advice on what stays, what goes, what's working, what's not working, and quick fixes on curb appeal. Because that was when Randy Lemon was designed many years ago, was designed to help a real estate friend out. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And you know, we love a discount. Um, I wanted to get to one more question. I know we're so close on time, but a great question came in um, from Sherry. She said, HOAs require trees in front yards on small lots. What is a good tree which doesn't have roots that interfere with plumbing in a few years? Oh, the the entire list that I have online about Randy's dozen best those root systems are not going to mess with plumbing anymore. It was things like willow that we don't, there's another one you never want to plant, but weeping willow trees, cottonwood trees, and and no one sells those anymore. And no Mm -hmm. one recommends planting those anymore in this market. So um, based on the plumbing, the way it's done now, you don't have to worry about tree root systems damaging plumbing. This was back when they did concrete pipes, concrete culverts, things like that. Those root systems were easy if they were that aggressive. Hardwood trees that are on my dozen best list, they're they're not that kind of threat. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, Randy, is there anything else that you want to share with, with our viewers this morning? Oh, you know what? Soil is the key to success. We kind of established that. And if you uh, will spend the money up front on soils and mulches, then you can have all kinds of fun buying cheaper plants and discounted plants and know that they're going to work. So when it comes to building beds, adding elements. It's the the key to success is always the soil around here. We don't have good soil around this. From Bryan College Station all the way down to Beaumont, Port Arthur, it's either clay, gumbo, caliche, Lake Charles clay, you name it. It is the worst soil that we can try to plant things in. And when you want to know why a tree that you planted is the same size it was when you planted it three years later, it's because it's hitting clay walls and the roots are not going anywhere and they're not mm. establishing and getting further developed. So that's the one of the best learning lessons out here is when you planted your own tree and you know it hasn't done anything in a couple of years because of the clay soil. That's why we have tips like tree planting techniques, building beds, uh, how to compost, aerate compost, top dress. Everything is related to how we improve the soil when it comes to gardening here along the Gulf Coast. Wonderful. Well, Randy, thank you again for all of your time this morning. We we truly appreciate um, all of the information that you shared. And of course, the, the discount you're providing for realtors if they are interested in using your consulting services. So we, we thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you. So just as a reminder, we will not have a member focus Monday next Monday, but the following Monday, we will be back talking about video marketing trends. And the very last Monday of March, we will be back with leaders from Texas Realtors. So if you have questions about video marketing or questions for our leaders at Texas Realtors, feel free to send those to me in advance. You can email me social at HAR.com. That is it for this Member Focus Monday. I hope to see you all in two weeks. Have a great one. Bye-bye.